everyone. Welcome to our March Tuesdays with. We're so glad to have you join us today. Uh, my name is Bob Willie, and I have the privilege of serving as president of Friends of the Georgetown Library. We're gathered here today to uh, have a wonderful experience in poetry. Our uh, title for our series of lectures that are presented monthly by uh, the Friends of the Georgetown Library is Tuesdays with, based on a 1997 best-selling book that is a story of a student and a professor that goes far beyond the college years. And that's exactly what we're involved in here, in continuing education for those of all ages as we recognize our continuing learning opportunities and abilities, especially here at the Georgetown Library, as we have this experience of understanding more of our community, more of our history, more of our nature, uh, more of our poetry, as we have this opportunity today as we're looking forward to it. Today, for our March program, we have Tuesday with Libby Bernadine, and we're very pleased to have her as our speaker today. Uh, Libby is a retired professor uh, of English from the University of South Carolina, a life member of the Board of Governance of South Carolina Academy of Authors, a member of the Poetry Society of South Carolina, and the Poetry Society of North Carolina. She's the author of three books, of poetry, book of myth, layers of, of song, and stones ripe for sowing. I have two of those here, layers of song, and Libby's gonna be talking more about stones ripe for sowing in the presentation. And above all of that, she's a friend of the Georgetown Library, and that makes her very, very special, and we appreciate that so much. One time in an interview when she, when she was asked, why do I write poetry? She responded by saying, I can't help myself. It's just a part of who I am. I love that. Poetry, both writing and reading it, she said, brings order, sustenance, and hope to my life. It's that simple and that complex. We look forward to her presentation today of Let's Talk Poetry, a conversation for those who love poetry and maybe those who don't. It is all about how to grow your interest and understanding of poetry. Libby, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you, Bob. And thanks so much to the Georgetown County Library System for providing the opportunity for me to be here, Bob especially, and Carol, and another friend, board member, um, LaVon Getman is here. So thanks to Heather, who's making this possible to, that you might be able to listen to it later on today. Um, I'm especially grateful to Julie Warren because as you will see as we go through today, she has put together a beautiful um, PowerPoint presentation for me. And the library has gone through, as many of you know, a very extensive traumatic experience with building back their computer system. So that must be quite a burden, but they've been very diligent. And as a library patron, uh, citizen of this county, I'm grateful that they are willing to go through all of that. I read in the Star recently, no, I read in the... Um, Post and Courier, the, the Charleston paper, I got ahead of myself there. There was a young man who's now an NBA star. Is that NBA is the basketball? I, I, I know football, but I don't know much about basketball. Anyhow, this is an award um, player who's won many, many awards. And his English teacher, when he was attending school in Spartanburg, I believe, discovered that this young man had the ability to write good poetry, and he urged him on, and apparently he does quite well. I haven't seen any of his poetry, but what I admire is the fact that here is this athlete that I suspect any of my four grandsons would know who he is and could provide background information on the young man. But think what an inspiration he would be to school-age children. And I'm hoping that if he is continuing to either read or participate in writing poetry, that he will continue 
to do that and to inspire young people. And think about that marvelous 22-year-old who um, read the inaugural poem. And I think we all just immediately were stunned by the beauty of the moment. Her beautiful colors, I think red in her hair and beautiful yellow um, color. And she just put herself out there. Her elegant movements just drew us all in. And she, gets, she spoke, recited her poem, like many young people do today, in such a beautiful, elegant way, and her movements just drew her, us in. And of course, her message was extraordinary, something we all needed to hear. So she spoke about unity, calling us into that as a poet. The citizens of, a, of our country, she as a poet, brought us into it. I'm quite amazed. Um, Gerard Manley Hopkins has used the phrase shining like ship fall in one of his poems. And that's how that felt to me that day. She was shining like ship fall. So the more young people are in the news and can speak about poetry, I think young people will grow up with it being more a part of them than when, say, I grew up and grateful for my mother who loved to read poetry and did a little writing herself, and my preacher grandfather uh, really encouraged me to listen and the... Um, rhythm of his, his speech when he preached was, I think, a calling to me to try to put po uh, poetry, language in poetry the best I could. Recently, a friend of mine said, what makes a poem? She asked me that. She's a musician. And she just said, well, what makes a poem? And I just had to think a minute. And I said, well, a poem is meant to touch the heart and the mind of a reader. And she said, well, how is that different from fiction? And I thought, good question. <laughs> because it is hard to say that it's very different because fiction does use some of the tools that a poet uses in writing a poem. But I think a, po a poet in writing is more intense more focused on a particular moment or a particular person. And think about a novel, and I know my friends who are here today have, we all read novels, and we know that this writer has created a world for us. And even if it's a memoir that might be more true than, say, more personally true than, say, a novel, it, we are drawn into it by the world the novelist has created. So it's far more expansive and can move back and forth in time a little better than a poet can. So because I was a little dissatisfied with my answer, I felt like I hadn't really enlightened my friend, I turned to Stephen Dobbins, who's a poet and someone I was reading at the time, and I'll have some other information about him for you all. He says um, the difference between poetry and fiction for him is that he tries to describe the world. It comes into existence when emotion suddenly links with image, idea, and language. And I think when he writes fiction, he says he creates a world. And doesn't that make sense? That when you're writing a poem, you're describing, here is what I see, here is what I hear. And when you write a novel, you're more expansive and you can go anywhere you want to with it. You create your world. He further states, I believe that whether one is a formal poet or a free verse poet, one is always involved with the relation between stressed and unstressed syllables. And I like that. I'd like to think of it more in those terms, stressed and unstressed, to create the rhythm in our lines and 
perhaps help a reader to better understand. So let's have a look at a few more comments. Yay, I did it. Um, Edward Hirsch and Matthew Zapruder, who are quoted here, are excellent poets, well-known poets, award-winning poets, and they write about poetry, just like Dobbins does. Reading poetry is an adventure in renewal, a creative act, a perpetual beginning, a rebirth of wonder. Reading poetry is an act of reciprocity, and one of the great tasks of the lyric is to bring us into right relationship to each other. The relationship between writer and reader is by definition removed and mediated through a text, a body of words. And some would say the poem on the page um, really doesn't exist until the reader reads it. So it is there between the reader and the poet. And you have a chance to make it yours, to make meaning uh, from it. Reading poetry is a way of connecting through the medium of language more deeply with yourself, even as you connect more deeply with another. It is a voicing, a calling forth. And that's what I meant by um, the young reader at the inaugural, the calling forth for us to think about her message and to bring us together. A poem, and this is Edward Hirsch's quoting Paul Celan, a French poet. A poem as a manifestation of language and thus essentially dialogue can be message in a bottle, sent out in the always, not always greatly hopeful belief that somewhere and sometime it could wash up on land, on heartland perhaps. Poems in this sense too are underway. They are making towards something. And how can we ever walk away from a message in a bottle? I've, I've actually found three in my lifetime. <laughs> I have to look right away and see what it is, and usually it's a joke. I never found, call me, or <laughs> I'm in France, would love to meet you. <laughs> um, and how to entrust our, uh, to entrust, trust our own instincts, we as readers. And that's what I want to talk to you more about today as readers, although... I have learned much from these people as a poet. I think I would like for you to think about, well, what am I learning as a reader of poetry? How to trust our instincts. It could be said, the relationship of poems to what we intuit but can never fully say makes them like prayer. That unending effort to bring someone closer to the divine without pretending the divine could ever be fully known or understood. And I think that's something about poetry that I feel that when I write, it's almost like in being in prayer. I think it's May Sarton who said, I don't use bad language in poetry because when I write poetry, I'm coming to the altar of God. And there is that sense of, of the sublime or the, um, the uh, sacred when you write poetry if you respect it and love it. That doesn't mean everybody has the same idea and or will write whatever they want to write in a poem that may in fact be bad language. We all know it does exist. So let's just take a poem and several that follow this one so you can begin to see some of the reasons that if you know a little bit more about poetry, it might be helpful um, as you begin to understand. Now, this poem is one I have actually memorized, the only one I have left. The day a crow shook down on me, the dust of snow from a hemlock tree has given my heart a change of mood and saved some part of a day I had rude. 
sweet poem. Easy for us to see what's going on here. We find the uh, crow. We know what the crow did to make the man happier, the poet happier, perhaps, Robert Frost. And he, um, he's dreading something, but now his burden has been uplifted a bit. And this poem actually should have more space between, um, let's see, here, this is the first stanza, and this is the second stanza. So there should be maybe two spaces here, or three spaces. And it rhymes, crow, me, snow, tree, heart, mood, part, rude. And I think that's what some people who are reading poetry today approach the poem and they say, well, it doesn't rhyme. Robert Frost rhymed his poems. Why isn't this fellow rhyming, rhyming his poems? Poetry today goes all over the page, but I don't think poem, poets have, have neglected rhyme. You find rhyme internally. You find it uh, in the rhythm of the poem helps you to think of rhyme as you're reading it. The use of certain vowels repetitively helps to create the rhythm and rhyme of a poem. So, let's see. And a poem can, is the most interesting thing about poetry to me is how it does concentrate on how we are as in everyday lives. This is by Ann Chadwell Humphreys, who is my close friend who's not sighted. She has lost her vision since she was rather young through a, I forgot what it's called, but pigmentosa of some kind. Cindy, are you doing anything? Would you hold the ladder, measuring tape, drive the tractor, close the gate? Am I interrupting filing the taxes if you happen to see my glasses? If I had a thousand pound cow and calf, how do I calculate the speed of the shaft? On your next trip into town, would you pick this up, drop this off? Bush hog markdown? Is our fill in the blank all gone? How do I turn the computer on? What was I saying? Where was I going? Which time are we talking about? Come sit. Keep me company. I'll read you poetry. And she has rhymed her poem. But look how ordinary it is. It is somebody that obviously lives on a farm. I know her parents did in Texas. And Almost all of us can get a sense of that, can't we? We may not know these questions, but I interrupt Phil, and he interrupts me from time to time. It's hard to interrupt Phil. He's better focused than I am. He's always working hard. All right, here's any question, any th comments about it so far? Well, um, here's my poem. South Jetty. South Jetty, joy of whispering surf, clouds at far skyline, sun gilds jetty's rocks, paints morning across smooth sand, lays color shoreward, ships rendered as if waiting for Winslow's brush, the restless sea thick with froth, offshore, maritime forest unseen. Memory skimmed as they rise to the surface. Yesterday's five sanderlings follow Brian's zigzag line. Little feet scurry. Once on a boat ride in the bay, we watched dolphins play beside the jetties. Frolic in sinuous waves, the vast sea rolls to a distant shore. Unspeakable beauty rides the wind, wild, ancient roar. O oh joy, O oh hope, O oh song of whispering surf. And this was one of our Christmas poems. This is what's called an ephrastic poem, and I, Dan, help me out here, but I think I can spell it. 
E P H R A R I no R A I S T I C. <laughs> it's a Greek word, obviously, and it's when one art follows another art or comes from another art. And in the first several um, stanzas, I guess first three stanzas, um, I am following the image in the in the photograph. And the what follows that, memories occur to me. I had actually, I was not with Phil when he took this photograph. Um, I need, I should stop for a moment and say the photograph is by Phil Wilkinson, my partner, who has a wonderful book that I will try to remember to pull up so you can see of his photographs. And from time to time we work together on this. But what happens is memories of the time I was with him out there arose, and also the memory that yesterday I had seen these little sanderlings skim along the shore. And I see that zigzagged shore here. So this is a poem that has order. It's not, uh, it's not rhymed, although, do you see rhyme in it anywhere? Yeah. And I do have two lines that rhyme, shore and roar, and bay and play. And poets often use more today the internal rhyme of things. And then the oh, hope, oh, oh, joy, oh, hope, oh, song, is framed by the start, it begins with joy of whispering surf and ends with that. So the, like the photograph, the poem is framed. But the O sounds in this poem helps, I think, to create, or I hope it helps to create a sense of, um, of rhyme and rhythm, repetition of sound. Dobbin says, a work of art has certain requirements that make it a work of art and not something else, such as a restaurant menu or insurrections or instructions, excuse me, on how to operate a car. A work of art must engage the intellect. It must engage the emotions. It must engage the imagination. It must function as metaphor. It must contain within it some definition of beauty. And I'm thinking maybe um, po uh, some poems I read today, don't, I don't really see a lot of beauty in them. Not, not to say they aren't effective, uh, well done poems, but as one person can say this about a poem, others will say, well, I, that's not my criterion but what makes a good poem. And keep that in mind, but all the things that I'm sharing with you today, it's just my view, although I do back it up with some, some good sources, but there are poems, there are all kinds of shapes of poems today, all kinds of subject matter, and things that are not as ordered even as what I have shown thus far. So metaphor is a very complicated um, idea, although we learn, we get the definition of definition of, of uh, metaphor because there is a comparison. It's, uh, it's a comparison of unlike things. But when you're writing, I find it very difficult to do a good metaphor, a right metaphor, one that truly does represent something of the idea in the poem. And because of that, I'm not really going to stress metaphor very much, although we do have one poem that I want us to look at, and we'll talk a bit about the metaphor. Okay, um, we're going to look at a poem that's very different from what we've read so far. Mosul. Does that put you in mind of anything, that, that place? It does. War, did you say? Yes, yes, okay. 
titles are essential. This is, pardon my pun, a loaded title. Because when you see Mosul, you think of Iraq and fighting and explosion and all kinds of things. The donkey, the donkey pulling the cart, the caravan of dust, the cart made of plywood, of crossbeam, and junkyard tires, the donkey made of donkey, the long face, the long ears, the curl lashes, the obsidian eyes blinking in the dust, the cart rolling, cracking the knuckles of pebbles, the dust, the blanket over the cart, the hidden mortar shells, the veins of wires, the remote device, the red light, the donkey trotting, the blue sky, the rolling cart, the dust smudging the blue sky, the silent bell of the sun, the Humvee, the soldiers, the dust-colored uniforms, the boy from Montgomery, the boy from Little Falls, the donkey cart approaching, the dust, the laughter on their lips, the dust on their lips, the moment before the moment, the shock wave, the dust, the dust, the dust. David Hernandez is a, an American poet, um, still writing, still, you know, as you see, young. But I think he's probably old enough that he might have been a soldier, but I don't know that. Um, I couldn't find that information. He's got a website, but he doesn't say anything about whether he actually served in Iraq or Afghanistan or in the Mideast. But what happens in this poem is so striking to me. Um, in, the, in the reading of the first, if we were, if we had the time, I would ask you to read this silently. But just quickly skim, and where in the poem do you begin to think, uh-oh, where do you see that? The blanket. The what? The blanket. Yeah, yeah. The mortar shells too. Yeah, yeah. And and as you noticed, I read it faster. And usually, short lines do make a poem go a little faster. But that's an example of the immediacy of a poem, because it's all right there, happening in the moment. And we can get this poem, can't we? I mean. We can see that this says, um, the boy from Montgomery? Well, it might be a boy from Georgetown or wherever you're from. We have a great falls in South Carolina, and there's a little falls. Um, bringing it down to somebody is suffering here, somebody American that we know, <clears throat> not to say um, Iraqis might not be suffering too. Silent, so I'm sorry, the silent bell of the sun really strikes me too. It's like the sun just keeps shining no matter what horrible things happen. Exactly. It just silently shines on. And that reminds me of um, a poem that I meant to look up and I forgot to do it. I think it's Donald, how do you pronounce it, Rebel? He's written that poem about the schoolyard. Do you, have you ever seen it? it? It's about what happens, an explosion, and this is in World War II, I think, and the bell is very prominent, and the idea of the bell is very prominent. It could be an illusion. I, I don't have any way of knowing that, but it did make me think of that other poem. And that's another thing about poetry. It... Um, Feeds for, it's a conversation that goes back in history. And if you don't read poetry and you're trying to write it, you're going to miss something. You won't be able to be a part of the conversation. Did you have a, a question? Well, I was just thinking this, that poem is so interesting in the way that it, there's, there's not one sentence in it. It's all phrases. There are no verbs to make a sentence. That, grammar would describe a very excellent point, and that's another thing that about a poetry, about a poem, is to notice. If you, when you walk away from here and you have 
Anything that you want to remember, if you read a poem, notice what's going on in the poem. Thanks. Very good, Dorothy. You're a good student. <laughs> There's a lot of action in there without any verbs. Yeah, yeah. That kind of speaks to your earlier point of how we... Uh, the poem maybe doesn't exist on the page. We you need a reader to connect with, and we sort of fill in all those those blanks of the you know we, we put the What's action happening? in there. To What's engage really the That's right, Dan. And and if you if you never read it, it's just not there. But then you see everything that occurs if you take the time to read the poem. There's also such a rhythm to this poem. Mm -hmm. That's really what drew me in at first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a long time. Right. It's just yeah. um, right. the part. They're fragmented, but all the sentence fragments. There's not a full sentence, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it also kind of accumulates that rhythm and the, all the repetitions and the power. Right. Do, do you know Hernandez's work? No, I don't. This is a, this is a very interesting find. Oh, well, good. He, he writes very lyrical poetry. I mean, it's not all like this, but I felt like I could say, I couldn't say that he was, he had to be there. I, I, how could you write a poem like this if you aren't there to see it? Um, and he might have been an, away from the explosion, but that he observed it. So you could definitely say the speaker in this poem is an observer. Let's go on to another poem, also about an explosion, and we know that right away. The word's never mentioned here, is it? I don't think it is. But here we have a poem by one of my favorite dear poems, Philip Larkin, D-E-A-R poem. <laughs> um, English poet and uh, is now no longer with us, but has left a wonderful body of work. If you're ever interested in exploring poets, look up Philip Larkin. The Explosion. <clears throat> On the day of the explosion, shadows pointed toward the pit head. In the sun, the slag heap slept. Down the lane came men in pit boots, coughing, oath-edged talk, and pipe smoke, shouldering off the freshened silence. One chased after rabbits, lost them, came back with a nest of lark's eggs, showed them, lodged them in the grasses. So they passed in beards and moleskins, fathers, brothers, nicknames, laughter, through the tall gates standing open. At noon, there came a tremor. Cows stopped chewing for a second. Sun scarfed as in a heat haze dimmed. The dead go on before us. They are sitting in God's house in comfort. We shall see them face to face. Plain as lettering in the chapels, it was said. And for a second, Wives saw men of the explosion larger than in life they managed, gold as on a coin, or walking somehow from the sun toward them, or showing the eggs unbroken. So, we know it's an explosion, but when do we get to what happens, what stanza. These, these are th three line stanzas. Smoke, when you see one word, it, it's meant to go on the next line. Um, smoke should be coughing, oath, edge talk, and pipe smoke. It's just the way it was put on the page. So um, where do we see the... Um, when, it, when the explosion happens, what stanza? At noon there came a tremor? Yes, at noon there came a tremor. Cows stopped chewing their cud, then went right back to it. 
Um, remember in the previous poem where Hernandez says, the moment before the moment? And of course that whole poem is a description of the um, explosion. Here, that's all we get. At noon, there came a tremor. And then, what do you make of the stanza that follows that? The dead go on before us. That's in italics. What might that be? The sermon at their burial? Possibly. Very possibly it could be that. It could be, I, I don't, although I don't recognize it as an illusion, it could be usually sometimes when you quote extensively like three lines from another poet or you do italicize it. But my, I'm, my, I'm like Bob, I'm thinking possibly that, that those are words from the sermon. We shall see them face to face. Plain as the lettering in the chapel. And then this... I just think it's an absolutely mysterious, marvelous ending. Wives saw men of the explosion larger than in life they managed. Gold, as on a coin, or walking somehow from the sun toward them. Can you get that image in your mind? Anybody ever see the movie Places in the Heart? It's, it's, it's had uh, Sally Fields and all those wonderful actors in that, in that movie. So, so, Dan, you're too young. <laughs> or have you seen it? I have seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's on, um, I think it's on Netflix or someplace like that. Phil, we watched it not too long ago. I had seen it when it came out, and you hadn't, so we watched it again. You remember that ending? The sheriff had been killed. The young boy that killed the sheriff was killed by the um, uh, the sheriff, the deputy sheriff. The um, African American man who came up to help um, Sally Fields played the wife of the of the sheriff who was shot, and he helps her. He helps her to make a success of her cotton farm. But he's smarter than the man who bought the cotton. The man who bought the cotton is a KKK man. And so he almost kills the black man. And in the end, he, ha he elects to leave the area, the black man does. But at, this, at the end where they're, I probably, I guess I'm ruining this for people who haven't seen the movie. But I think it's important because at the end of the movie, there is, in the pews, taking communion, there are all these people who have gone. They're either dead or have left. And also there's um, a, a blind young man in it, too, that it figures into the, into the movie. But my point is that I think this is like some existential idea in this last part, the idea of um, the immortality of the soul. And if you think about the eggs as a metaphor, one showing the eggs unbroken, and you have seen it earlier before the, before the um, actual explosion, then you have the um, kind of like no matter your religion, the, the cycle, some cycle of life, um, it remains unbroken. There's an old hymn that says that. So I, I feel like that this is a poem that demonstrates that, that what has occurred in the image that we're left with at the end is the men who have been killed in the explosion are reunited. Um, the women and um, their families are reunited. So may Philip Larkin forgive me if I've misinterpreted anything. Okay, um, I think we're doing good on time. Have another sip? I 
think, Libby, I'm a little late here, but I just want to say this poem brings up one visual image after another. I mean, it's very visual. Mm -hmm. This or this poem, yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful images in it. Yes. Yeah. I think all the poems um, I've intended or hope that you would see with, within all the poems I've chosen is that there are um, strong images in, in most of them. So I want to go now to... Winter Grace. We'll go a little different. And I, if, I hate to get in your way, but I need to stand away to hear this one, to read this one. This is another, ephrast, it's not an ephrastic poem. It is Phil's photograph. But Winter Grace was written by Patricia Fagnoli, who lives uh, in the Northeast somewhere, as you might imagine with this beautiful poem. And so she did not write the poem in relation. I just thought Phil's photograph matched it so beautifully. Winter Grace. If you have seen the snow under the lamppost piled up like a white beaver hat on the picnic table, or somewhere slowly falling into the brook to be swallowed by water, then you have seen beauty and know it for its transience. And if you have gone out in the snow for only the pleasure of walking barely protected from the galaxies, the flakes settling on your parker like the dust from just born stars, the cold waking you as if from long sleeping, then you can understand how, more often than not truth, is found in silence. How the natural world comes to you if you go out to meet it, its icy ditches filled with dead weeds, its vacant birdhouses, and dens full of sleeping. But this is the slowed down season held fast by darkness. And if no one comes to keep you company, then keep watch over your own solitude. In that stillness you will learn with your whole body the significance of cold and the night which is otherwise always eluding you. Can you pick out some images in this poem? I feel like I'm in Canada in the Northeast. The what? Yeah, it's cold. It's cold, yeah. I yeah. Mean, she, she describes going out in the snow, I and mean, we've all done it. Well, I don't know about you southern people, but <laughs> 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 we really have experienced what she began writing about. Yeah, yeah. Well, look at the, the white beaver hat. Isn't that perfect? Do you see any others? The flakes settling on your parka. The what? The flakes settling on your parka. On the parka, yeah, yeah. And you can actually see the snowflakes, the shapes of them. Yeah. Right. And for someone that, um, I know you probably have been in a lot of snow over the years. For me, I, I get so thrilled because it's a day of snow and then it goes away. Although we hit, did in 1973 have a big snowstorm. I went to bed that night, it was snowing. I woke up the next morning, it was snowing. Totally shocked and surprised and in wonder. Um, one of the things I want to say about the poem and about poetry in general, syntax is really important. It's another thing that I would love to have done more with, but I, it just, I needed a little more time. Um, but if you have seen the snow, then you can understand. And that's a typical English way of putting something together. It's a structure. And many poems do things like that and helps you to understand them as, as you begin to look at them closely and look at the syntax in a poem. I've, I'm going to have to move on. I'd like to spend more time with this beautiful poem, but 
I want to move on to what I'd like to conclude with. Any questions, though, or anybody want to ask anything about it? It, it makes me recall a time when I was expecting my first child, dumb pregnant person, right? And my husband was overseas, and I was sort of alone. And I, it snowed like this. I love your picture. At any rate, I thought, well, I'll take the dog for a walk. We all need to be exercising. And I walked, and I walked, and I walked, and I got so far, the dog fell down on the ground. And it's cold, cold, cold. And I thought, what do I do? You know, how am I going to get home? And I felt like your picture looks like I was there with the dog. I was, I was walking in that picture. You were? Did you see my dog? <laughs> okay. I had to where was, where was this taken? North Carolina. Western North Carolina. <laughs> About, up about 5,000 feet. Wow. Beautiful part. I love you. Yes. Yeah. I love the fence. My favorite line is, truth is found in silence. My husband and I could have predicted that because we lived in the north and my favorite memory of snow is there was no noise. If, it, if you had a big snowstorm, you couldn't hear traffic, you couldn't hear everything was muffled. Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful, there's no silence like that. Right. Yes. I have been in Boston in a snowstorm, and it's amazing. Um, anyway, I need to move on. This is a lovely poem, and all of you here have demonstrated what I love about being able to share with people that you have responded to this poem with your own experience, and that's one of the things that I think is important as we... Um, read poetry and write it ourselves. You hope somebody's going to see something in it that reminds them of their own lives. Okay. Um, this is Lucille Clifton, an American. Um, oh, an amazing poet. If you, she's another person. If you'd like to look into poetry a little more, I would certainly recommend her work. Um, but as you see by these titles, we know right away what this poem is about, don't we? Tuesday, 9-11-01. Um, I'm going to read there. She goes right on through till Sunday, and I only have three up here, but I'm going to read the ones in between because they're very short. Um, Tuesday, 9 -11 -01. Thunder and lightning and our world is another place. No day will ever be the same. No blood untouched. They know the storm in other wares. Israel, Ireland, Palestine. But God has blessed America, we sing. And God has blessed America to learn that no one is exempt. The world is one. All fear is one. All life, all death, all one. Wednesday, 9-12-01. This is not the time, I think, to note the terrorist inside who threw the brick into the mosque. This is not the time to note the ones who cursed God's other name the ones who threatened they would fill the streets with Arab children's blood. And this is not the time, I think, to ask who is allowed to be an American. America, all of us gathered under one flag, praying together safely, warmed by the single love of the many-tongued God. Thursday, 9-13. The firemen ascend like Jacob's ladder, into the mouth of history. Friday, 9-14. Some of us know we have never felt safe. All of us, Americans weeping, as some of us have wept before. It is treason to remember what we have done to deserve such villainy. Nothing, we assure ourselves. Nothing. Saturday, 
I know a man who perished for his faith. Others called him infidel, chased him down and beat him like a dog. After he died, the world was filled with miracles. People forgot he was a Jew and loved him. Who can know what is intended? Who can understand the gods? Sunday morning for Bailey. The St. Mary's River flows as if nothing has happened. I watch it with my coffee afraid and sad, as are we all. So many ones to hate, and I cursed with long memory, cursed with the desire to understand, have never been good at hating. Now this new granddaughter born into a violent world, as if nothing has happened, and I am consumed with love for all of it. The everydayness of bravery, the hate of fear, of tragedy, of death and birth and hope, true as this river, and especially with love, Bailey Frederica Clifton, going for you. And that G left off is intended by the writer. Um, well, first of all, I guess the what I have shown you here is very different structurally. In fact, no punctuation is used. But I have gone through using syntax, and you can pretty well find, the, with the use of a, like a, making a sentence, it, you will find them in her stanzas. And I don't, have not, I have a lot of, I have a lot of her poems. This one is entitled Mercy, the book. Um, I, I don't know that she always lower cases, but I think in most of her poems she does. Now, Lucille Clifton was a well-established poet by the time of 9-11. She had books and awards uh, by that time. And she wrote this after, of course, the tragedy. But think of how many people who never wrote a poem in their lives wrote poems about this. And one of, in my old Brooks and Warren anthology that I studied years ago, uh, the editors made the point to say, the role of the poet is to chronicle the tragedies of our lives. And that's always stuck with me. Um, especially since I had a student practically cry over it, saying, why are poems so awful? They're about death, and why can't they be about life, and blah, blah. Well, I remembered that quote, and it stuck with me. But uh, this is remarkable, don't you think? Uh, the way she has put the poems together, and her undertone. Anybody pick up on any other undertone? Yes, this is about 9-11, but what else is it about? Dan, you're shaking your head. I mean, it, it's all about the moving, trying to move forward, and, and it's sort of, uh, I guess, to quote Langston Hughes, another great uh, African-American poet, to, to let America be America again. Right. The definition of American and not restraining that in the wake of 9-11, in the wake of the trauma. But it's also, there's, you mentioned it's about, uh, it, it is about death and tragedy, but mm -hmm. it's also there's, there's life at the end and hope. Yes, her, her granddaughter. Yeah. yeah. So there's love, is, there's fear, but love is the, maybe the counterweight to that. Mm -hmm. And also, there, there's one thing in here that is ironic. I didn't put it up there, but it's Friday. Some of us know we have never felt safe. Right, well, that's exactly yeah. what I noted. And that struck me more forcibly than anything else because any person of color or religion that isn't the founding father's religion or anything at all apart has pe um, the, the people, particularly the people of color, don't feel safe, they've never felt safe. And that 
is astonishing to think that there's a whole huge group of people who have grown up and never felt safe. In America. In America. Mm -hmm. And they talk about, or she talks about, or says, that she says, oh, one. And I thought all the civilized countries, civilized, I'll put in quotes, countries in the world, they all have aspects of racism or bias in one way or another. There isn't any country that doesn't. Right. You know, and that, that makes, that actually makes the world one. Yes, that all countries face this, and she brings that out. And at the end of this poem I just uh, started, some of us know we've never felt safe. Um, what have we done to deserve such villainy? Nothing. We've done nothing. And there's more to say, but I have to end, you all. And um, I'm going to read uh, one, in with one of my poems. And thank you all for being here. It was such a treat to have my friends here. Um, and that the library allowed seven of us to be together. Eight count me, I guess. Um, but that was really helpful since I'm more accustomed to a give and take. I'm not a uh, lecturer by any means. So I'll end with this poem. Sun-splashed ryegrass near rose perfume in the garden. I wish to catch it before I light the fire under the crisp leaf collards and the cold water filled kettle, the taste of frying shrimp on the long ago river where uncle fried catfish and hush puppies. When the Winnebago pulled up with my cousin stepping out in her blue blouse and tight black pants, wearing our days together with all the stories, the gone away wisdom people now filling our arms as we race toward one another, ready to give them life. The farm, the mule, the althea tree, that life, backlit and obsolete, full of contradiction, what we chose to remember. Thank you very much. Thank you, Libby, very, very much for a wonderful presentation. As uh, she mentioned, we are at a historic moment for the library and our Tuesdays Whiz series, and we have a, quote, audience today. And uh, it's been nice to have a small group together. It was actually a year ago that Libby was scheduled for mm -hmm. uh, this presentation, on the, and unfortunately... On the 17th. On the 17th, yeah. and, on, and unfortunately, we needed to, at that time, as it were, postpone it and our schedule was off until we then started back in uh, October with our Tuesday with series. And even those were just uh, presentations without an audience. So this is our first treat to be able to have this. Inter it is really a treat to have an interactive time together. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that uh, Libby had recommended that with a group of friends to be able to join together, to be able to interact a little bit. So we'll see how it goes for the future as we look to uh, April, May, and June. So Libby, thank you. Uh, I do want to mention again her book, Stones Ripe for Sewing, um, which is the book that's over there as well. And then Phil's book. We want to mention yeah. Phil's book do. as well. I'll hold that up. So you've enjoyed some of Phil's f photography, uh, Phil Wilkinson's photography. Uh, this is one specifically about seven days on the Santee Delta. And uh, highly recommend a beautiful book, beautiful content, beautiful photographs, and anything else you want to say that. Uh... Well, I'm just really proud of it. He's <laughs> done. <laughs> He's done a wonderful job, and he let me put a poem in it. <laughs> oh, so there, a poem is in there as well. Yeah. And uh, as well, I want to thank Heather. There actually is a ninth person here who's the hiding behind the scenes person. Uh, Heather Pelham, who is incredible in her providing of uh, the video and uh, the opportunity to be able to send this out then to all of you uh, to be able to share in this experience today. Again, we are so grateful in the context of the difficulties that the county is having in regards to the county system, is having in regards to computers, and so grateful for the many who are involved right now in restoring that for county services as well as the library services. 
Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is a monthly event, and uh, next month we will be having for our April Tuesdays with Paige Sawyer, uh, who is a local historian, Georgetown historian, and professional photographer. And he's bringing both of those gifts together in his presentation on Wonderful Winyaw Bay, Secrets of an Estuary. And we hope you will join us on April the 20th, the third Tuesday of the month, which is our regular date for those events. Uh, in addition, again, I want to thank everybody, Libby, for a wonderful presentation today. Oh, thank you. For the audience, for sharing with us, for Heather. And we thank you for joining us and hope that you will join us again next month. If you would like to keep up to regular events and dates that are involved with our friends at the Georgetown Library, I send out a weekly update of these days. We used to do just a quarterly report, but all the special things that are happening, uh, for instance, we reference these events with Tuesdays With. Uh, we make reference to what's happening with the Friends of the Waccamaw Library as well, and also special events for children uh, that are online and available for books that are being read and special activities, art activities, and other kinds of things that are happening. If you're interested in knowing more about those, send me an email, and I'll put you on that list of updates on a monthly basis. My address is rwilly, W-I-L-L-E-Y, 1019 at gmail.com. If you send me your address, send, uh, send me your address, I'll put you on that list and keep you up to date. To all, thank you. God bless. Stay healthy. Bye.